بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, this is Dr. Saeed Al Thani uh, from Dubai I'm a sport and shoulder surgeon uh, this is uh, our first combined webinar between the Dubai shoulder course and the Egyptian Arthroscopy Association and uh, this is uh, for me it's a pleasure to be hosting uh, this session uh, today we'll talk about shoulder stability and technique the exchange uh, exchange different uh, way of doing uh, fixation of the uh, shoulder stability between the EGA and the Dubai shoulder uh, course. The first speaker is Dr. Mohammed Shiwi, a uh, uh, surgeon from uh, sports surgeon, a shoulder surgeon from Al Qasr Al Aini. And uh, he will uh, enlighten us about how to do a uh, bad cut uh, repair in a B chair position. Dr. Mohammed, stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Saeed. Very kind introduction. Thank you very much. I'll share now my screen. How I do a banquet repair in the beach chair position. This is how we do it in Cairo University, Qasrani Teaching Hospital. As you all know, Qasrani Teaching Hospital was created in 1827. It's almost 200 years now. So it's a very old school, medical school. And uh, our sports, uh, sports injury unit and arthroscopy was created by Dr. Ahmed Abdul Aziz, our professor in the early 90s. So it's almost another 30 years. We are proud of it, and we're proud to be part of the AGA, the Egyptian uh, Arthroscopy Association. First of all, in the beach chair position. The beach chair position, the patient is uh, placed under general anesthesia in the supine position. Then the back of the table is elevated to 60 to 70 degrees. This actually is variable between the sitting position and the relaxed recumbent position. First of all, we must confirm that the buttocks is well padded against the table with pillows below the knee to relax the hip and the knee. This relaxes the sciatica and improves the venous return. Also, we secure the patient in position using a safety belt. We secure the opposite arm to the abdomen or on an arm board uh, uh, to protect it against brachial plexus injuries. The head is well padded and secured using a tape to avoid excessive flexion and extension, which may cause some neurological damage or affect the tube patency. Optimal position is with the mandible two to three uh, finger breadths from the sternum. High thigh compressive stockings are used to reduce any cranial hypoperfusion. Interscleen plexus flock is used in some cases, not all cases, uh, as uh, it may allow better control of pain postoperatively. The advantages of the beach chair position is that it allows easy access to the anterior and posterior parts of the shoulder at the same time, with easy conversion to a, from arthroscopy to open techniques if needed. It decreases the incidence of brachial plexus injuries, uh, decreases uh, uh, preparation time, thus it decreases the whole operative time. Anesthesia, uh, as regarding the anesthetologist, it is better for him as he has, has better access to the tube as well as decreased facial edema. The disadvantages is cerebral hypoperfusion. The beach chair position and the hypotensive anesthesia asked by us shoulder surgeons, we all ask for hypotensive anesthesia to decrease bleeding and decrease tissue swelling. This may lead to some cerebral hypoperfusion. The instance is almost one in every 22,000 cases. Second step is diagnostic shoulder arthroscopy. We check the attachment of the rotator cuff to the head. We check the biceps tendon. We check the attachment of the biceps tendon to the superior labrum. We, check, we also check the labral injury and we check the, uh, whether there is any capsule redundancy or not, and any other pathologies such as a large Hissax lesion engaging or not engaging. Uh, 
Then we create the anterior working portal. The classic anterior working portal, we use for first a spinal needle, then we introduce our troker. Uh, it is usually just above the uh, edge, upper edge of the subscapularis. But nowadays we've changed into a lower position of the anterior portal through the subscapularis to allow direct access to the uh, fifth position, uh, five o'clock position of the first anchor. Then we assess the extent of the labral tear. Uh, as we all know, a Bankert lesion, Bankert lesion was uh, first described by Bankert in 1938. It, classically, it extends between three and six o'clock, but it may extend backwards up to seven o'clock and may extend upwards up to the superior labrum and the anchor of the long head of biceps. Then one of the most important steps is to release the anterior labrum. We use a scalpel or uh, an, whatever uh, tool to, to achieve a freely mobile labrum. This is very important. Otherwise, I won't be able to uh, reduce the labrum back to its original position. Then we prepare the bed. This is, from my point of view, the most crucial step in a banker repair. If we have a raw bleeding surface on the anterior glenoid neck, even if I do not an ideal repair, it will heal. But if I don't have a bleeding surface and the anterior edge of the glenoid, it won't heal. So from my point of view, this is the most crucial step of the surgery. I may use a shaver, I may use an abrader, I may use, a, even sometimes I use an acromizer. Just decorticating the anterior edge of the neck to reach a raw bleeding surface. Then I place a tractional suture into the inferior labrum. This suture will be later on used to pull on the uh, labrum upwards during my repair. This may achieve some sort of uh, capsular shift. As we all know, in recurrent cases, there is some sort of interstitial injury for the anterior capsule, especially the anterior band of the uh, inferior guillotin complex. Here I used a double armed uh, PDS number one. Then we place our first anchor at the five o'clock position. The anchor is placed two to three millimeters from the edge of the uh, glenoid. I use a single loaded anchor, single uh, suture loaded anchor. Then using a bird peak, I pull on one of the two strands of the suture material taking care to take a good bite through the anterior labrum and part of the capsule as well. I always do that. Take a good bite through the anterior labrum and part of the capsule as well. Then I check for the uh, suture material being mobile. There is no knots in it. There is no entanglement, nothing. Here's checking it for being totally free. Then we perform a sliding knot. I don't use a mattress knot. I use a simple uh, suture, simple knot. Taking care to place my knot on the labral side of the suture. I do not place it on the glenoid side of the suture. This is very, from my point of view, this is important because placing such a suture at the glenoid side, this is an unabsorbable suture. So it may, in some cases, cause some sort of friction, some sort of discomfort, especially in professional athletes. So I usually place it on the labor side of the repair and not on the glenoid side. This also create, uh, helps in creating a good bumper at the anterior labor. Then we tighten this knot in this position on the labor side of the repair. This creates a good anterior bumper. 
Then we place the second anchor. The second anchor is placed at the three o'clock position. This is about one centimeter above the uh, first anchor. I usually use a simple, single, uh, single uh, suture anchor. I use the bare peak to pull on one of the two strands of the uh, suture material. Then I perform a sliding knot. Also taking care to place the knot on the labor side of the anchor uh, of the labor repair, thus creating a good bumper, as we see here. This creates a good anterior bumper. Then the third anchor is placed at the two o'clock position. Finally, I check for my repair. I check the uh, good labor repositioning. We check there is good fixation. There is no gap between the labrum and the anterior glenoid leg and good bumper formation. It is not working. Thus, we achieve a good result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for uh, your nice uh, uh, way of presenting uh, your uh, your technique. Uh, so uh, there's a question, but I will leave it uh, for uh, after we finish with uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, no, Dr. Ali will talk about the lateral decubitus, how to do bank after lateral decubitus. Shall I start, uh, Dr. Sari? Yes, please. Um, so I'm not going to discuss a lot on my uh, indication, to be honest, because I do understand this is uh, more of uh, talking about a little bit of the surgical technique uh, and, and focus on it. So um, I have to say that my indication for arthroscopic bank art repair has changed over the past 15 years. Um, and, and there has been always a controversy whether we should do it open or arthroscopic, and, but this is not the, the platform for discussion which is open or arthroscopy. But uh, today I will talk about my current practice and the indication. My indication currently basically is for um, dislocation with uh, minimum glenoid bone loss uh, for people uh, less than 20 years, a first time dislocator. Even for people above 20 who have two episodes of anterior shoulder dislocation, females, and non-contact collision sport. I'm not talking about this part, and uh, although some technique has shared, and I'm going to skip those slides, if you don't mind, that's... And I do uh, look at the what we call the shoulder uh, uh, or the instability severity score factor that below have uh, Dr. Pascal below have popularized. Uh, I think this uh, this uh, prognostic uh, looking at those prognostic factor can give you um, can give you some indication of the people that you're looking at and should you go for open uh, with latter J or arthroscopic bankart. So um, the CT scan in my practice is very important. 3D CT scan is very important. So I, I always have to look at it. We look at the circle sign and see how much of that. And if there is significant uh, bone loss, and people nowadays say more than 15%, uh, you should be thinking, um, and this is, could be even a combined bone loss between the glenoid and the uh, uh, humeral head. Now, my current use, I use all type of knotless uh, and knotted uh, type of suture anchors. I use nowadays uh, old suture. I use peak as well. I, um, I, I, have, I have been over the last three years uh, with the introduction of all use, uh, old suture, small anchors, I might use that. So this is, has been introduced into my, I have introduced this into my practice and um, this is something new. Uh, I have moved away from the use of bicomposite. Uh, so basically, mainly my practice now is between peak anchors and all suture anchors. Um, I'm not going to discuss. Uh, so 
uh, I have been doing uh, anterior shoulder stabilization in, in the, uh, the lateral position, lateral decubitus for the past 15 years. Um, this is my preferred. Now, occasionally I might switch when I think this patient might need latter J, which is I'm, when I'm not sure, I might switch to a B chair, but uh, the majority over 90% is a lateral position uh, B chair. So, and I use basically um, uh, three portals that I'm gonna show you in another uh, photo pictures, uh, antero superior, antero inferior, and a standard posterior viewing portal. So I do a diagnostic initially uh, with the posterior, and then I move to the anterosuperior portal for viewing. So my viewing uh, always through the anterosuperior, most of, uh, almost all the time. And I do use cannula, and I found them to be useful. This is my, my practice. And uh, we're gonna go through this when I'm gonna show you the video about it, uh, liberation and mobilization of the capsule labral complex uh, as uh, Pre previous speakers uh, touched on this, it's very important uh, and the preparation of the medial uh, glenoid neck is very important. And I use uh, three suture anchors as well. And we start from six to three or from six to nine, depends on shoulder I'm doing. So uh, the, the, the important part of this is to get the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament to, uh, to be tensioned well and uh, you need to repair the labrum and tension the capsule and do a capsulography and do sometimes if there is laxity that you feel you should do a capsular shift i don't do any interval closure so this is the position uh, that i put my patient in um, i you can use any simple traction uh, this is sophisticated uh, attraction um, for the arm but um, I, I really sometimes I use very basic in my new hospital now, I use very basic traction and, and it does do the job. Now you have to make sure, with, you have to work with the anest anesthesia team. Uh, th those are your partners. The anesthetist has to be very good in giving, I get them to give a, 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 scal a scalene block because I, all my patients go home on the same day. So I do those procedure always as a day surgery. I've been doing this for at least five years now. I send all my patients, even rotator cuff, except the elderly who have medical equipment, uh, medical, sorry, medical mor uh, comorbidities. Otherwise, everybody goes home the same day. So uh, we do give a scalene plug, and then after anesthesia, we make sure the head is very well neutral. And, and this is the responsibility of the anesthetist. You have to make sure all the uh, axillary roll and perineal batting and everything to protect the nerves. Uh, this is the responsibility uh, of me or my assistant. Of course, I always make sure that the arm is, has been, I seen the patient on the, day, on the same day of surgery. I always want to see the patient, re-examine them again. Uh, things might change. And, and that because you see so many patients, you forget what this patient is. But when I see him on the same day before surgery, I examine him to remind myself exactly. So when I go with the scope in, I know exactly what I'm looking for and what's there. This is not so much for someone who has recurrent instability, but some of those patients might have a pan um, labral tear, slab, posterior labral. Often I see patients who come to me with other problems. So, and, and, and the traction is not significant. So this is the three portal technique that I, I use basically anterior superior, anterior inferior. The anterior inferior is the working portal. Anterior superior for me is the viewing portal and the posterior is where I park my suture. And, and, and that's what uh, I do. Uh, this is the Western knot. It's a sliding lockable knot that I have been using for the past 15 years, actually, I have not changed it. Uh, to me, I like uh, the way it gives me the tension. Now I do use knotless and I have introduced knotless into my practice and I mix and match sometimes uh, whenever I can start with a knotless and uh, nothing and then I, and, this, and the more, and the more uh, superior um, 
uh, anchors I might use not list. So I hope this, this is just showing you, uh, this is not the video I want to show, but this is a patient who has significant, I do uh, diagnostic and this patient is one of my patients who I ask him to come to have the surgery done five years before he came to me. And this is the damage of recurrent dislocation that what that what does to you is not only labrum is articular cartilage this patient has significant health sac lesion uh, this patient has an engaging health sac lesion so when you go diagnostic uh, you, you know even when i do lethargy i do diagnostic as well and you can see this patient has an engaging uh, you know, hill sacs, so, and damage articular surface. So those patients, when they come to you after five and 10 years, often because of pain, because they got used to the recurrent dislocation, they know how to reduce it now. But why they're coming to you? Because of other pathology, and often is damage to the articular surface or slab lesion. Then when the picture change, they come to you and you need now uh, to, fix it and this patient actually ended up having uh, a lateral gear procedure now this is this is one of my uh patient that i did so i will go with this so i do the diagnostic and you see how lax is this patient there's laxity with him there is no significant bone loss but i felt he has a mild to moderate head sac lesion um so basically i thought uh I was uh, going to do a ramblissage on this patient, but what I found with him as well, that this patient does not only have an anterior banker tear, actually he does have a superior labral tear. So now before I start my uh, repair of the anterior labrum, I decided to do uh, uh, I started to do the slab lesion. So I, I, I went ahead and Repair, prepare the superior glenoid uh, for the reattachment of the slab lesion. And look at that. This is a way of checking if it's slab or not. You see, when I push with the Schaefer down on the anchor, you see how the anchor goes down? The anchor goes really down. So this is the preparation of the superior glenoid with the Schaefer from the anterior inferior portal. Uh, and now with the rasp, I, I go, uh, I, I make my anterosuperior entry here. Now I use a shuttle, uh, one of the uh, uh, tools to shuttle and I, I've taken the suture now after shuttling. Now I will get down uh, uh, through the anterosuperior portal. Uh, this is the drill and this is the fixation which will be fixed with a knotless anchor. And this is, this is slab lesion fixation. Now. I move away to, uh, I finish with that, I go to the, I went again to do the um, ramp dissage and I'm not gonna, because this is another talk today, I'm not gonna go through it, but this is ramp dissage. Now, this is the posterior, posterior, and this is the anterior, and, and look at this, I'm viewing, this is a beautiful way of looking at the labrum, from top, like aerial view. You've got a superior viewing, you can see back, front, uh, you can see anything you want around the whole labrum from anterior, superior, uh, anterior, inferior, and, and inferior. So here it is. Um, I do my preparation. I use um, the liberator anyway, and, and you need to liberate, as we discussed in the previous talk, uh, from top to bottom down to the six o'clock in this particular patient, at least from two to six. And I use uh, the liberator first. Uh, the good thing about this labrum, this patient has two occasion of, and I think two or two, three occasion of the dislocation. But look at the, uh, look at the labrum. It's a good quality labrum. The bone loss is not, this is your ideal arthroscopic bank art repair. This is the patient who was ideal. There's no significant, nothing, no bone loss, no significant, but you have a tear. And now look at the anterior band of the uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament. You can see I am releasing it right to the six o'clock, but you've got the band there very easily. Uh, uh, you can observe it nicely uh, in this particular patient. Uh, so I use the rasp, I use the, and now here I am gone with the first anchor. Then 
I use the um, shuttle again here uh, to, you, you know, just to shuttle sutures around. This is my first anchor. It's double loaded. I use double loaded because I like to repair the labrum and use the other suture to um, do a capsule raffi and imbricate in this particular case. Uh, so, um, this is uh, shuttling, and here I am. I shuttle two sutures uh, through, and one of them I will do the typical uh, just uh, uh, suture, uh, which uh, just like the previous speaker, I put my suture on the labrum, and that's very important. Don't put it on the glenoid. So here I am. I'm gonna uh, use a sliding. Um, a sliding uh, lockable knot and I like those because look at the way I can tension the labrum I have the feel for it I can take it and pull it and tension it nicely and this is this is what I feel now when I the way it is well tensioned now and you can see that bumper effect it's it's there uh, very um, very well observed uh, in this repair so this is one that I've this is the most inferior anchor. This is the most important anchor because once you're done with this anchor, you almost, uh, you feel the head has been centered. You feel the way once you're done with this anchor, a lot of the time the head centered already. So this is your, the most important anchor. Now, I decided to do a mattress suture with the other suture of the double load. So the, most, the inferior uh, anchor was a double load anchor. So one of them was um, a regular uh, knotting and the other one I did it in a mattress fashion. So this is, uh, will be done in mattress. Now I move away to the second uh, suture anchors. And, and now here I'm gonna use knotless. So uh, I, I pass the thread first, then I, uh, do the anchor bring in and this is a knotless anchor for the second um, for the second suture anchor another third uh, a top anchor and here i am i'm going from 5 30 to about four o'clock to about three o'clock uh, so here it is i did not pass the three i did it all my anchors out there so and then at the very end here my rub research and that's the uh, basically the procedure as you see it uh, being done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali and Dr. Mohammed, for the nice presentation. Uh, there is uh, the, the only question we have for uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, how can you explain your portals in more details? Well, I use well, I use the the standard procedure uh, portal for visualization. This is a portal placed two centimeters and uh, inferior and one centimeter medial to the uh, posterior edge of the uh, chromium, and I use a standard anterior portal. Uh, I used to use a standard anterior portal, which is placed in the triangular, the, the what's known as the soft spot, which is the triangular area at the upper edge of the subscapularis. Nowadays, I use another portal, which is a more inferior portal, passing through the subscapularis fibers to get direct access into the um, um, uh, five o'clock position or even lower at five and a half o'clock position. Okay, so there's no more question and uh, Q and A. So we'll move on to our third speaker, Dr. Amr Rashwan. I will talk about how I do Rambersage procedure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, the EGA and the Dubai Shoulder course for giving me the chance to have uh, this presentation. Um, my intended learning outcomes will be what will be what is the Hilsas lesion, the incidence, 
the different treatment options of the heel sas lesion, the algorithm for managing uh, shoulder anterior shoulder instability. Then we will talk about what is the reemplacage, the indications, the equipment needed, and the technique. At first, the, the heel sas lesion is an impaction fracture of the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head as a result of anterior green humeral dislocation, first described by Flower in 1861, but named after Hill and Sachs, who had been the first to describe the mechanism by which it occurs. It occurs in about 67% in the first time dislocators, reaching up to 80% in patients with recurrent anterior instability. Various treatment options have been proposed for the hill sachs lesion, like the reemplacage, the rotational osteotomy, an osteoarticular allograft transfer, a disimpaction, a partial prosthetic resurfacing, and finally the letter J, which allow increasing the glenoid arc uh, to keep the hill sachs lesion on track and will, will be discussed in our uh, next uh, talk. So I usually follow the algorithm for the bipolar lesions uh, in shoulder instability uh, proposed by Itoy et al. As we can see here in the hill sachs lesion, uh, which are on track with a glenoid loss less than 25%, we will go for a soft tissue procedure like an arthroscopic banker tripper. In hill sachs lesion, which are off track with a glenoid bone loss less than 25%, we will either go for an arthroscopic banker repair with a reemplacage, as we will discuss, or a letter G procedure in throwing a treat. For a heel sas lesion on track with a glenoid bone loss more than 25%, our option will be the letter G procedure for heel sas lesion off track with more than 25% glenoid bone loss. It will be either a letter J or a letter G with a humeral sided procedure by combining a letter G with reemplacage or bone grafting the humeral head. So what is the reemplacage? It is a French word which means to fill. The concept of reemplacage is to perform an arthroscopic uh, infraspinatus stenodesis together with a posterior capsulodesis, rendering the Hilsach's lesion extra articular so it will, it will not re-engage the anteroinferior inferior clinoid labrum and so we will reduce the risk of recurrence. Originally described by Connolly, but the arthroscopic modification had been introduced by Wolf and Pollack in uh, 2004. Uh, the aim of the ring plassage is to keep the heel sachs lesion away from re-engaging the anteroinferior inferior glenoid labrum. In addition, the posterior capsulodesis will limit the translation of the humeral head anteriorly and consequently will reduce the risk of dislocation. So our indications for a reemplacage procedure is the patient with a recurrent uh, shoulder instability with a heel sachs lesion and with a glenoid bone loss uh, less than 25%, and also indicated for moderate and large heel sachs lesion, maybe in conjugation with the letter J procedure. So what are the equipments that we need to prepare before going to such uh, a, a procedure? We will need our arthroscope in the anterosuperior viewing portal, we will need a switch stick in the posterior portal. We will need a half sleeve cannula at the posterior portal, a seven millimeter cannula anteriorly in the anterior mid glenohumeral portal, a curette, a shaver, a suture hook, or a bird beak, a double loaded anchor, and a knot push. Uh, I will describe the technique of reemplacage in the peach chair position using a standard posterior portal, performing an outside in anterior mid glenohumeral portal and an anterior superior portal behind the long head of the bicep stem. As we can see here in such a video, this is a right shoulder, this is a dry scope, and then we will start our inflow cannula and we introduce uh, the, uh, the needle be sure to be able to reach the most inferior part of uh, the labrum to be capable to perform a, a proper arthroscopic repair. Then introducing the anterior middle glenohumeral cannula. As we can see here, this is the detached labrum. 
which needs to be properly released. Here we are introducing the anterior cannula through the rotator interval at, as the anterior mid glenohumeral working portal. Before doing the reimplassage, we had to uh, rasp and repair uh, and release uh, the antero inferior labrum back into position before performing uh, our reimplassage procedure. Then we will take uh, the arm in abduction external rotation. As we can see here, this is a large heel sachs lesion engaging the antero inferior glenoid. Uh, Edge. As you can see here, this is a large Hilsax lesion. Then we will switch uh, uh, the portals. This is an antero superior viewing portal. As we can see here, this is the detached labrum from the medial aspect of the glenoid neck. And this is the switch stick in the posterior portal. Here is taking the arm in abduction external rotation to expose the uh, heel sachs lesion. We are viewing from the antero superior portal, and this is a right shoulder. Then through the metal half sleeve cannula, uh, like those who have been used for uh, meniscal suture uh, repairs, we will introduce the shaver across. Uh, the middle sleeve cannula, depriding the heel sachs lesion, creating uh, a bleeding surface to allow for the integration of the infraspinata stenodesis. But take care not to remove too much bone while uh, creating the uh, bleeding surface. Then the half sleeve cannula is introduced again and we will start to introduce our anchor. Here's the anchor introduced into the heel sachs lesion. It is a metal double loaded five millimeter anchor. We will introduce the anchor until the laser mark on the introducer, and then we will remove the applicator. As we can see here, this is the double loaded anchor. Then uh, a spinal needle is introduced to, uh, as a trajectory for uh, the lateral aspect of the infraspinatus and then the bird beak introduced to get our first suture limp out of uh, the infraspinatus. Try to take it as far lateral as possible to avoid entangling the capsular tissues medially which affect the range of motion. This is our second bite, more medial three to four millimeters from our first bite. Also avoiding to take the medial capsular tissues in order to avoid affecting. And this is repeated until all our four sutures had been taken through the infraspinatus stand. This is again uh, a left shoulder viewing from the antero superior portal, using the shaver to deprive the uh, footprint. And then using the half sleeve cannula, we will introduce our anchor. Introducing till the laser mark. And then this is single loaded anchor. Then we will introduce through the infraspinatus, as we can see, the bird beak to take the first limb of the suture. And then we will repeat the same step to take the other limb. 
also we are trying to avoid the medial capsular tissues to avoid affecting uh, the range of motion. Here is our second bite through the infraspinatus tendon. And here is the second limb of the suture anchor to be taken outside through the infraspinatus to perform a mattress suture to fill the Hilsach's lesion. This is the way uh, we should be keeping away from the medial capsular tissues. This is the correct position. And here is the incorrect position because entangling the medial capsular tissue will affect uh, the range of motion. Then after uh, passing the sutures through the infraspinatus, we will shift again anteriorly through uh, viewing through the posterior portal to uh, start our pancreas repair. We didn't tie uh, the sutures of uh, the um, limb plasage uh, before performing our capsular, uh, our uh, pancreas repair anteriorly, because if we uh, tie uh, the, um, the anchor for the limb plasage and uh, the suture limbs, this will affect our visualization and our working on the anterior inferior glenoid uh, labrum. And so uh, we just pass the sutures and we keep them in uh, the subacromial space ready. Then we shift to perform our anterior uh, pancreas uh, repair. As we can see here, this is pulling uh, the uh, labrum to uh, its original position, having our sliding knot and having our pamper effect at the end through inferior glenoid labrum, doing the second suture, second anchor, and finally our third anchor. As we can see here, the pamper effect and repair to uh, the end through inferior glenoid labrum. We are probing here our repair. Then we switch back for the reimplassage here. We are pulling the infraspinatus into the defect, as we can see here. And then the sutures will be tied in a mattress position, moving the humeral head to be more centralized from the suplex position anteriorly. Uh, our take home message is that we should completely mobilize the antero inferior glenoid uh, labrum and capsular tissue, the pancreas lesion before the reimplassage. We should evaluate the location of the Hilsax lesion and our need for reimplassage. We should prepare a bleeding bone bed for the reimplassage. We can place one or two anchors according to the size of the Hilsax lesion, usually adjacent to the uh, intact articular surface. The sutures for uh, the reimplassage should pass laterally through the infraspinatus and not the medial capsular tissue to avoid limitation of the range of motion. Thank you for your attention. And this is our institute, Castrolaini, which is about 200 years old now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amr uh, uh, for uh, this nice demonstration. Um, and before we go to uh, uh, questions, let us uh, finish with the last uh, speaker, Dr. Ali uh, Magdisi from Kuwait, who will talk about uh, letter J. Good evening, everybody. It's my great pleasure to associate with the Egyptian Arthroscopic Society, which is a society that has been uh, uh, that has taken its reputation. It's my first time to present with the, with the, such a prestigious uh, uh, establishment with the Dubai Shoulder Course. I thank my colleagues, Dr. Saeed, Dr. Ali, and the co-presenters. Uh, I don't have any disclosures relevant to this talk. It's my great pleasure to present with my co-authors, some pioneers in the job excellent surgeons with excellent uh, techniques and videos. 
So to start this talk about how to, to, to make a lateral J procedure, I would give you a small case scenario. A 23 year old young man, right hand dominant, complaining from a right shoulder recurrent anterior instability, who first started after a small motorcycle accident four years prior. He's not a sport uh, related person and is really suffering from his uh, recurrent instability, even when sleeping, sleeping and sneezing. <clears throat> this is how he looks like it's the right shoulder. He has an external rotation of about 85 degrees versus the left sh other shoulder at 90 degrees, full range of motion at the time of representation. These are his radiographs confirming the anterior shoulder dislocation and showing the Bernajo view without a real uh, bony lesion. But when I go to the CT scan, of course, in this case, it is an MRI, I find that there is a significant anterior bony lesion with a small heel sacs lesion and uh, not so much pain, an ISIS score of three points due to hyperlaxity and anterior glenoid lesion, which pushes me myself to go for a lateral J procedure. So lateral J is a procedure that uh, has been uh, in, in, in practice for now many, many years with proven results. And uh, even though non-anatomic, non still produces excellent results. So this is how I position my patient, depending on where I work. Uh, as I work in multiple establishments, I think this is the best position to do in a place that you do not have many, uh, many equipment. It's a beach. It's just a supine position with a small pillow under the medial side of the scapula with the patient lateralized outside the shoulder, outside the table. Of course, if you have the arm holder, it is uh, preferable. If you don't, then your assistant can help you with, with this. So here is a small animation of the procedure I do. It's uh, the one that established by the company. We will go then to the real video of the surgery. So this is just for the people who do not understand, who do not have an idea of the surgery. I do it with a small mini open approach, a coracoid ostotomy, a subscapularis split, a preparation of the anterior glenoid wall, and then the fixation of the bone block using two 4.5 semi-cannulated uh, stainless steel screws without washers. So this is my current technique. It's going to go through the video in another 30 seconds. So you see the split of the subscapularis at about two thirds, one third, placement of the retractors, exposure, exposure of the joint, refreshment of the anterior glenoid, and then guidance using the specific tools given by this company to uh, fix your bone block at the best position. So this concludes this animation. Now we go to the real surgery. So this is a, the, the real surgery of, of, so it's a mini delta vector approach starting at the tip of the coracoid process at about five to six centimeters. Start with a delta pectoral interval, start working directly, lateralizing the vein exposing the conjoint tendon, releasing the medial side of the conjoint tendon, placing your Hohmann retractor above the coracoid process, releasing the coracochromial ligament as far as you can laterally, while the hand is in abduction external rotation to have the maximum length. Then you split and release the medial side of the of the coracoid process with a pec minor release. Go as far as you can posteriorly. Do not be afraid of the brachial plexus if you stick directly to the bone and you will definitely face some bleeding. At this area, do not be afraid, coagulate. Release the undersurface. I use this 90 degrees curved saw to, to osteotomize my coracoid process as far as I can go. And I like it when I get that inferior part uh, long and fear part coming out. I complete usually my osteotomy using an osteotome, a curved osteotome, and using a strong forceps, I pull slowly, releasing the lateral tissues very close to the bone, and then inverting my coracoid and nicely grasping it with such an uh, instrument. I then start releasing the undersurface from the tissues, but I make sure that I do not release either the harvested CA ligament on the lateral edge or the conjoint tendon, keeping it attached. 
I then revive the undersurface and make sure that I have at least two centimeters of length. Using the specific jig guide, prepares two four millimeter holes that I mark very nicely to be able to find them when I'm in the deep. I then go down to the next step, which is the subscapularis split. I use a tag suture here to make sure that I find my coracoid process once I am more deep. So then I go to maximum external rotation, and then I place my retractor more inferiorly, and I start to find my superior border of subscapularis and inferior border of subscapularis marked by the three sisters and more medially the musculocutaneous and the axillary nerve. I find the two third, one third. I split horizontally on the medial side and not, I don't like to go too much to the tendinous part. I slide in a mayo scissor. I split the muscles medially until I find the white tissue that I like, which is the humeral capsule or the, the glenohumeral joint capsule. I slide in a uh, gauze to make space for my retractors. If I'm thinking of leaving it, I tag it with a suture so I don't lose it, but I usually do remove this. I then place a specific retractor to hold my split intact and start doing my arthrotomy. I feel the junction in the joint and I do this horizontal split and place my Fukuda retractor into the joint. This would expose the anterior glenoid and retract the humeral head. I then start resecting all the anterior labral tissue, plus if any remnant of a bony bank cut medially, remove it with a curved osteotome to get a nice bleeding surface. I then re-get re 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 my uh, bone block by pulling on my suture. I place the specific jig that would help me orienting my bone block directly flush. I like to see the edge of the cartilage and I like to be a couple of millimeters more because do not forget that cartilage is a couple of millimeters more. So if you put it directly at the level of the cartilage, then you are lateral. So be a little bit more medial and it's normal to have this tangential view. After doing that, I drill just the far cortex or the anterior cortex of the glenoid with the 3.2 millimeter drill bit and attached attach two 4.5 titanium or stainless steel uh, uh, semi-threaded screws. I then start attaching or reattaching my anterior labrum as my anterior capsule by making two PDS sutures between my uh, CA ligament and remaining humeral capsule. I then remove my gauze and check that I am not impinging on anything in rotations. I do not touch the subscapularis. And as you see, I am respecting my five centimeter scar. So this is what I expect of such a patient. So this patient, the scar might be a little bit larger, but I see nice bone healing with good positionment of the bone block with good range of motion and back activity. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ali, for a nice demonstration. Uh, it's a small incision, like within five centimeters. The most important is not just the incision, but the most important is the fixation. <laughs> if you can make it small, that's fine. But... 